Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Robert Price. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research here at, on the Berkeley campus. And on behalf of the University of California at Berkeley, it is both my pleasure and honor to introduce the keynote speaker today, a key figure in, in cross-strait cross -strait relations, Dr. Lian Chan, former Vice President of Taiwan, Chairman of the Lian Chan Foundation for Peace and Development, and Honorary Chairman of the Kuomintang Party. A scholar, a public servant, and a visionary statement, statesman, Dr. Lian has been a leader in building ties between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China. He comes to us today to share his experience and his vision of the future in a region once a flashpoint of the Cold War and now a peaceful, prosperous, and, evo and evolving in its own democratic culture, evolving its own democratic culture. Dr. Lian Chan was born in Xi'an, in, in Shanxi Province, China. He was educated at the National Taiwan University where he received his bachelor's degree in political science and master's and Master of Arts in International Law and Diplomacy. He went on to study in the United States, earning his doctorate in 1968 from the University of Chicago's Political Science Department, one of the premier political science departments in our country. I say one of rather than the <laughs> premier political science department because there are several members of the Berkeley Political Science Department here in this room, and I myself am one of them, and I refuse to give up any status points to Chicago. Once completing his doctorate, Dr. Chan taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and at the University of Connecticut before returning to Taiwan and to the National Taiwan University, where he taught in the political science department served as department chair and as dean of the Graduate Institute of Political Science. Dr. Lian moved from the academic sphere to public service with, with his appointment in 1975 as ambassador to El Salvador. Prior to his career in elective office, he went on to serve as minister of communication and transportation, vice premier, foreign minister, governor of Taiwan province, and premier of the Republic of China. In 1996, he became vice president. After leaving office, he has devoted himself to resolve the, tension, the tensions across the Taiwan Straits, whether from within or from without, whether from within or without the, pres or, or, or without the presidential palace, Dr. Lian has remained dedicated to the service of his country and his people with work that carries significance far beyond the region. In today's talk, he takes the long view, looking back over China-Taiwan relations as they evolved over the past half century. With a scholar's methodical analysis, a government official's insider perspective, and a statement, statesman's vision, Dr. Lian shares with us today not only history, but an insider's view of how, how history is made. It is my pleasure then to turn the floor over to Dr. Lian who will present his keynote address, 60 Years of Cross-State Relations from Conflict to Conciliation. Uh, Mr. Associate Chancellor, uh, distinguished guests, and uh, members of the faculties and uh, administration, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude to be invited here to this university. Berkeley is one of the greatest university in the world, and I'm very privileged to have this opportunity to uh, address this group. My assignment today, as uh, the chair just mentioned, is uh, a topic on the cross-strait relations 
during the past 60 years is a very big problem. And therefore, I will certainly concentrate the latter part, and particularly the recent past, as my focus. Uh, according to the Chinese way of counting years, we all know that uh, every 60 years is a one jiazi, or one cycle. And uh, each and every year of this cycle derive its name from the combination uh, of 10 heavenly stems and 12 earthly branches. They got their name, jiazi, for example. And there's also another way of counting years, and that is the concept of si, generations. 30 years is considered one generation. So three decades is one generation. According to the uh, folklore and conventional wisdom, the cycles and the generations proceed with alternating fortunes. So therefore, you have a Chinese saying that political power resides. 30 years reside on the west of the, bank, of the river. Another 30 years, political power resides on the east bank of the river. It changes. Now, this is uh, said to be true of uh, a person's uh, life. Uh, it is also said to be true of the nation's destiny. Now, in almost two weeks' time, the People's Republic of China will be celebrating the 60th founding of the PRC. Therefore, from 1949, to 1979 will be regarded as the first generation if we use this Chinese way of counting years. The first generation, of course, is the generation of Mao Zedong. In cross-strait relations, I think it can be characterized as a generation of conflict and confrontation. On the one hand, it was a period of continuation of the civil war. On the other hand, it was a period with the extension of Cold War into the Taiwan Strait area. I don't have the time to tell you about how many battles were fought. The fluctuations of Taiwan's uh, international status during this extended period of 30 years. But this is all past. Today, I'd like to concentrate my talk on the latter part, the recent generation, starting from 1979 to 2009. Well, in 1979, we saw the beginning of another generation led by Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and uh, Hu Jintao. It was a generation, comparatively, comparatively speaking, rational and uh, pragmatically oriented when compared with the previous generation. But uh, the ascendancy to power did not bring any immediate change in the cross-strait relations. We find uh, on the first day of 1979, the People's Congress, for the first time, uh, issued a public letter, letter to the Taiwanese compatriots. In that letter, 
it called for the cessation of hostilities, the termination of military confrontation, and also appeal for the resumption of talks and hoping that it will lead to the realization of the establishment of the three links, meaning mail, trade, and transportation. But this appeal was uh, rejected outright by Taipei. In its stead, Taipei launched its counter proposal, the so-called three no's, no contact, no negotiation, and no compromise. You all know that. But the interesting thing is that in the same time, at the same time, in the early 1979, there was a group. It's called Taiwan Gongzhuo Xiaozhu, meaning a working team on Taiwan affairs was established within the Communist Party of China, chaired by the chairwoman Deng Yanchao, wife of Zhou Enlai, and co-chairman uh, Liao Chengzi. It is my belief that in the subsequent years, you can detect a subtle change, at least in the slogans of the Communist Party vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan. The changes from downright military liberation of Taiwan, gradually it shifted to a peaceful reunification. I think in April of 1984, Deng Xiaoping, for the first time, formally appealed with his proposal of one country with two systems. He pointed out that he hoped that the KMT and CCP will cooperate for the third time because we have cooperated in the past. He wanted to do it again the third time. He also promised to give Taiwan a status of the so-called ASAR, a special administrative region. But this appeal was again turned down by Taipei because it was regarded as a convenient method suitable for the handling of issues in the post-colonial Hong Kong or Macau, but it has no market in Taiwan. So what we did at that time was a counter proposal, meaning one country with one good system. Uh, that sounds much better. But I must point out this, uh, this is the beginning. But uh, the mid-century war considered or deemed to be necessary for Taiwan's security had brought on the island an extended period of martial law rule. Thank you. Which in turn subjected all connections across the strait to the suspicions of espionage or collaboration. The American recognition of PRC opened a floodgate. When people, private citizens, in their uh, private capacity, such as uh, remittance of funds, personal correspondence, indirect business contact or family reunions, led the way restructuring the relationship in social, economic, 
cultural lives, and the politics across the street. I say this because in October 1987, Jiang Jingguo made a very important decision out of humanitarian consideration. It was also under the pressure of many social groups petitioned on behalf of the nationalist veterans. Zhang per permit the veterans to revisit the mainland for their family reunions after 40 years of forced separation. Beijing responded very quickly. Actually, the, second, the next day, Beijing responded in favor of the return of all those KMT soldiers. Well, as a result, thousands, tens of thousands of the veterans went back to the mainland. Most of them are recorded as tragedies. As one commentator put it, for those veterans, for them, the first time going out is going home. Very sad. But once the door is opened, it signified the beginning of people-to-people -people contact or exchanges across the street, on the one hand. And also, on the other hand, it signified the, although not formally announced, the abrogation of the so-called three no's policy uh, made a few years ago. Uh, to be sure, <clears throat> Other citizens followed the veterans, particularly the businessmen. They followed the veterans and went to the mainland together with their capital, their technological know-how, their new style of management, and sometimes they even participated in the writings of laws and regulations on the local level. Taiwan businessman. And I think this is very, very important because earlier you find private citizens uh, with their civilian initiatives uh, created a new situation while the government or the state remained backward looking or controlling. This disparity in turn created a set of dynamics which in turn forced or moved the government to dismantle all the antiquated laws and rules or the state of mind to catch up, to keep up with what the citizens uh, wanted at that particular moment. So with this flood of visitors to the mainland, new issues arise. And uh, we find both government on both sides began to know that something must be done. And then you have a sequence of actions. On the one hand, on the top level, on the mainland, a Taiwanese Affairs Office was established under the State Council. Two years later, in Taiwan, the Mainland Affairs Council was established under the cabinet. We also enacted laws, it's called statutes, governing the relations of the peoples 
across the Taiwan Strait. So you have the formal organization, governmental and party organizations. But those organizations cannot talk to each other. In order to solve problems, you have to establish proxy organizations to talk to each other. Therefore, in Taiwan's case, a so-called SEF, uh, Straight Exchange Foundation, was established. On the mainland's case, ARATS, Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Strait, was established. SEF and ARATS, ARATS, became the proxy organizations for both sides to contact in handling day-to-day -day issues. They don't stamp visas on each other's passport, but they do issue a booklet. It's called permit, allowing compatriots, or the either uh, Taiwan Taiwanese competitors or the mainland competitors to visit Taiwan or to visit mainland. Now, with this proxy organization established, the next step is to get together and talk. So they did. In 1992, October of that year, for the first time, both sides sent delegations to Hong Kong and uh, started talking and negotiating. We find very soon they hit a snag over the definition of the principle of one China. They cannot move. What are you going to do with this? For Taipei, one China means ROC. Both Taiwan and the mainland China constitute that China. For Beijing, it is PRC, and Taiwan is a part of that China. But then they soon find that after separately declared their different interpretations on that issue, they could shelve that issue for the time being and move forward to handle, to proceed for formal business talks in the future, which they did. This was essentially what was later called the 92 consensus, or one China with different interpretations. On the basis of this consensus, the principles of two organizations, Dr. C.F. Uh, Gu, uh, and uh, Mr. Wang Daoyuan, Wang Daohan, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Wang Daohan uh, met the first time ever in April of 1993. And as a result of that meeting, four agreements were signed. And in the addition to that four agreement, I remember there were at least 24 rounds of officially unofficial, or you called unofficially official, <laughs> uh, round of negotiations took place after that meeting. And 24 round, another 24 round of secret, secret negotiations also uh, took place. All this brought a new stage of rapprochement. A new state set in the cross-strait relations. It was during the subsequent years, at least eight or nine years, that Taiwan continued its economic development, fast economic, economic development. It also continued its very smooth democratization process. At the same time, it also consolidated its 
international relations with many countries, including the United States. Because it was during this time that Taiwan became the second largest uh, buyers of American military equipment, next only to Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah. And also, of course, the cross-strait relationship flourished. Very good period. But then, some unfortunate episode started. One of them, short, was made by Mr. Li Denghui. And that caused uh, the missile crisis between 19, uh, uh, f uh, 65 to 66, uh, six, I think. Uh, uh, 95, 1995 to 1996, yeah. Mr. Lee went to visit his alma mater. That was considered to be provocative. So missiles launched. And then he did it, another thing by declaring the so-called special state-to-state -state relations that to characterize the relationship between the across the street. All exchanges aborted because of this statement. But this is only very, this is a short episode. But the most serious and longer episode was the one, uh, well, made or launched by Mr. Chen Shui Bian. <laughs> yeah. We all know that uh, Mr. Chen is an advocate of Taiwan independence. Yeah, and uh, despite the majority's wish to maintain a status quo in Taiwan Strait, he immediately, after took power, initiated a series of policy departures. And this series of departures uh, have been characterized as uh, so-called salami tactics. What do you, what they mean by salami uh, tactics? That's, it means by implementing incessant uh, conflicts to gain political grounds with or under the mistaken understanding that the United States is behind him. He proposed to use for example, referendum to make a decision on whether Taiwan will go to the United Nations or not. He wants to change the name of the country. He wants to write a new constitution, so on and forth and so forth. So his action certainly alarmed the United States and angered the PRC. Before the 2004 election, presidential election, United States for the first time lay out a clear position on many contentious uh, issues across the street. For the first time, formally. In this policy de uh, declaration by the United States government, United States made it very clear that United States is in favor of greater exchanges between the two sides. It hoped that the three links be realized uh, that will benefit not only Taiwan and the mainland, but also the international society. It refuted the DPP's argument that excessive reliance on the mainland will lead to a hollowing out of Taiwan's economy. United States rejected that. And of course, Mr. Bush made it quite clear that United States government stand opposed to any unilateral change of the status quo in the Taiwan 
straight area. Now with this, I think this essential is essentially beneficial for the to preserve for the preservation of the precarious situation or balance in the Taiwan Strait area at that particular moment. But unfortunately, Mr. Chen went along, uh, believing that the United States is still behind him. In one occasion, I think it's on in September of 2007, Mr. Chen declared before a Taiwanese World Taiwanese Federation, and he said, after the process of democratization and the, the abrogation of the so-called uh, unification, reunification guideline and council, a new country has been born. And that country is named Taiwan, with a territory of 36,000 square kilometers and a population of 23 million. Very, very provocative. Earlier in, the, in May of that year, Mr. Hu, Hu Jintao, uh, went to New York attending the 60th anniversary of the United Nations, appealed to the United States that the United States and China co-manage the affairs of the Taiwan Strait situation. In a separate talk to Bush, he called active, both sides actively strive to uh, stop Taiwan independence movement. Well, all this has its result. And that is uh, in <clears throat> March of that year, 2005, Beijing passed a so-called Anti-Secession Act. For the first time, formally declared that it will use unpeaceful means in the event of Taiwan independence. A public opinion poll conducted by a Chicago institution around that time indicated around 74% of those pulled on, on the mainland believed at that time that the problem of a cross-street problem can be solved only by military means. This is, a, of course, very, very serious. It was under this situation and uh, environment that I, as chairman of the KMD party, in order to reduce tension and also to protect the regional peace and stability, and also want to give the Taiwanese people a viable alternative, I accepted the invitation of Mr. Hu and visited uh, Beijing on April 29, 2005. This was the first time in 60 years that the head of KMT and the, the head of CCP met and talked to each other. During four sessions of friendly and frank discussions, we came out with a statement of five points of vision. Namely, number one, resumption of dialogues under the principle of parity and the 92 consensus. Number two, we call for the termination of hostilities 
and the signing of a peace agreement, including the uh, so-called confidence building mechanisms. Number three, promote full-scale economic cooperation between the two sides. Number four, promote the exchange of views concerning Taiwan's international participations. And number five, the last point, we established the party forum uh, that will lead us to meet once every year at least. <clears throat> so, this is the <clears throat> this is the uh, the picture that we worked together at uh, that moment. We reported this to the government, the ruling government of Taiwan at that time, ROC. The DPP government refused to accept. But on the other hand, because we have to face a lot of common problems on a daily basis. So we did, starting from that point, develop a system of coordinations. I call it the five systems of cross-street uh, discussions. On the top level is the party leaders meeting. Not scheduled, but unscheduled. The party chairman meet the party chairman. This is very important because a lot of issues were solved, for example, the <clears throat> meetings between SEF and the ARATS should be resumed, was decided. For example, Taiwan's participation in the WHA was conveyed and discussed in this meeting. So this is a very important mechanism, among other things. The leader-to-leader -leader meeting between the two sides. Then the second level is what we call the party-to-party -party, uh, conference. Uh, <clears throat> All together, we held five meetings on this level with 94 conclusions concluded in these meetings. The importance of this meeting is it handles with many day-to-day -day businesses. For example, the contact between the two sides in agriculture, in technological operation, uh, in tourism, uh, and many others were discussed 
and uh, in principle, and followed by the functionaries to deal with the local with the with the details. The opening up of tourism, for example, was participated by both the uh, party functionaries and uh, government officials in the capacity as advisors. And many problems were solved on this level. Then the number three uh, uh, con uh, level of contact is the level uh, between two government by proxy handling the issues of the Taiwan businessmen, their problems on the mainland. Uh, the Taiwan office and uh, our related office work together to solve the problems of the individual Taiwanese businessmen when they confronted with problems that cannot be solved immediately. So this is the third level. And then you have the fourth level. And that is the, uh, the sisterhood <laughs> arrangement. For example, you have uh, Taipei with Shanghai. Uh, the uh, Taichung with Amoy, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Kaohsiung uh, with uh, uh, Chongqing, you know, this sisterhood relationship for exchange of personnel along this level. And finally, you have the grassroots arrangement. For example, in this past year, the, there was a, a cross street seminar about almost 10,000 Taiwanese people visited the Fukien coast, coast in five cities, participating in religious, economic, agricultural, and other activities. So this is what really happened. But now I want to come to something that is more serious. All this are economic. But what happened to the most important political issues across the street? To be sure, <clears throat> the crux of this issue lies in the political solution of the cross-strait relations. In our discussion with the General Secretary, uh, Mr. Hu, we understand that uh, it is difficult uh, it is also time consuming to solve the political issues across the street. But we do have to start, to have a start. It is believed thus with the exchange of good feelings and the, a confidence building process, misunderstanding will gradually dissipate and uh, hopefully a political entente, cordia, could be established. But we are not naive enough to say that this will be all red light, I mean a green light. So in case there's problems, we have to uh, leave aside, putting aside the controversies, uh, 
dealing with the consensus. Uh, so to make advancement gradually to the eventual cooperation. This is what exactly we reached upon on our first contact, first meeting. As a result, I must say that uh, political issues cannot be avoided. Mr. Hu mentioned three times in 19, uh, 2007, 2008, and 2009, hoping that the initial contact on political issues should be tackled by both sides. And in Taiwan's case, also, Mr. Ma ying earlier as the party chairman in London, in London, a school of economics, he pointed out that the political issues must be taken up uh, as an important stage for overall detente in the future. During the election in Taipei, he once again pointed out that uh, if elected, he will proceed to political negotiations with the mainland uh, immediately uh, in order to bring the peace and stability that is expected or hoped by both sides, and particularly the people on both sides. So this was the general background. I must point out here at this moment that, uh, among other things, there is a general consensus among the people that Taiwan must proceed fast and steadily with the mainland on important issues of political accommodation. And there is some consensus One can say that has been discussed, debated, not accepted by all, but nevertheless, it was a consensus that people with different political background believed that it is important. I would like to mention five of them. First, it, uh, of course, deal with uh, the nature of this political arrangement. According to the principle of 92 principle, one China, but differently stated, or the constitutional principle of one China in our constitution. That is one China before the unification of China. People hoped that uh, a interim arrangement could be derived from this basic principles. This is a uh, Number one. Number two, military uh, issues. It is uh, believed that uh, we cannot reach uh, a comprehensive military arrangement 
by one stroke. But gradually, it is believed that we can, through piecemeal approach, leading eventually to the conclusion of arrangement on military issues. Therefore, you have the <clears throat> idea of uh, so-called uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, joint maneuvers. You have the idea of uh, uh, establishment, establishment of organizations uh, carrying out joint exercises. This will gradually lead to the most thorny issue, such as the military confrontation uh, and other things. In other way, this is a gradual process uh, to work out peace relations across the street. Number three, you have the foreign affairs area. It is hoped that, that both sides uh, will reach a uh, modus vivendi or temporary agreement, such as the WHA or the APEC. In, a, in, a, in, in, in other words, on um, bilateral diplomatic relations, we should reach a freeze, a policy of freezing that number. And in international uh, relations, multi-relations, international relations, we should do it case by case. So another one, of course, is the economy. There are so many things that has already been achieved by our economic cooperation. If need to be, if it need be included, all these conclusions can be included as one of this arrangement. I cannot mention all the details, uh, but this is a very, very important uh, progress uh, made in the past. Now, because of the time, the pressure of the time, let me conclude that uh, The relationship between the two sides is a very important and uh, international issue. It has been one of the most enduring conflict in international politics. To handle with care is prerequisite for local, regional peace and development. But we are optimistic because, first of all, China had made enormous progress in the past 30 years. Uh, it has more confidence in dealing with both domestic and uh, international affairs. It is therefore hoped 
that China will exhibit empathy with Taiwan and uh, treating Taiwan in a way commensurate with reasonableness and uh, empathy. As one of the greatest scholars and philosophers of China, Mencius once said, the big country must use uh, tolerance, not overbearing, to treat the small states. The small state must use smartness, not impulse, impulsiveness, treating the large state. I think this is a, a wisdom that worthwhile considering. Number two, I want to point out that uh, in cross-trade relations in the past uh, uh, decade, I mentioned that uh, the two-way trade has already stand at 132 billion a year. This is the last year. With uh, uh, 99 billion in export and 32 billion in import from the mainland in Taiwan's favor. Without this, some 66 billion U US dollars, Taiwan will be in a very serious deficit. So the economically, this is a very, very important and, cru and very uh, close and important relationship. And uh, number three, according to the public opinion polls, conducted three public opinion polls conducted in the first part of this year about the cross-street relations. 70% expressed their hope that uh, a peace agreement be signed across the street. This is uh, in line with the earlier public opinion polls uh, conducted in the late uh, 98 last century, and one in 2007, one in 2008 all come with the same uh, result. There are many other, uh, many other reasons that I can mention here, but uh, due to the, the time, I cannot elaborate in very great detail. But I must point it out that <clears throat> both the CCP and uh, the KMT, as well as the mainland and Taiwan, have come a long way in history. We both witnessed the division of China in the past. We also witnessed the period of Cold War, the period of hard war, and now we are entering a stage of reconciliation. We don't really know what were the purpose of the great uh, divine design on China. But we do understand that there's one thing that wanted most by all Chinese people, and that is China, including both sides, do not want any more suffering, any more bloodshed, and any more war. It is based on this belief that I think our sons and grandsons, next generations, 
will definitely feel proud of us, what we are doing today in pushing uh, the relationship across the street in search for peace and development, cooperation and reciprocity, reciprocity. Uh, and of course, a win-win situation for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lian, for that sober and balanced discussion of a very difficult topic. I'm now going to ask Dr. Michael Sony of the East Asian Languages and Civilization Department at Harvard University uh, to make a few remarks uh, in response. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lian, for those very stimulating remarks. Uh, you are uh, all, no doubt, as I am, uh, wondering what I'm doing here. Uh, neither a statesman uh, nor a, a political uh, um, figure, uh, nor political scientist, nor even a uh, specialist on the study of Taiwan. Um, just to try to answer that question, I think the reason I'm here um, I'm, of course, here at the invitation of Professor Ye, uh, to whom I owe great thanks for her support in this and other areas. Um, the reason I'm here is that for the last uh, almost decade, I have been working on a project on the uh, social history of Jinmen, of Kamoi, uh, in the uh, post-1949 period, um, which uh, um, uh, part of that research recently um, produ produced a book called Cold War Island, um, which fits nicely with, and, and the last chapter, of course, is about Jinmen moving away from being a Cold War island. So it fits well with the theme of Dr. Lian's remarks. I think that uh, Dr. Ye invited me here with the expectation that I would offer some reflections at a human level based on my work uh, in doing field work in Jinmen, talking to old fishermen and old soldiers and old farmers, um, a bottom-up analog to Dr. Lien's remarks. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of that. Um, Jinmen is very, very rich in stories, uh, and I'll share some of those with you. But I think it would be rather poor use of this time to articulate in detail positions that I've already taken in print. Um, instead, I want to, so I'll talk a little bit about Jinmen, but I also uh, uh, want to follow up on Rob Weller's example this morning. Rob, this morning, an anthropologist dabbled in political science. Uh, I'm a social historian. I'm also going to dabble a little bit in political science here and talk about some things I know very little about. Um, democracy, democratization, uh, the internal politics of the PRC, and the PRC's position in the world today. Um, uh, as a way of introducing some other uh, uh, ways of thinking about the issues that Dr. Lian has shared with us today. Um, I find myself in general agreement with the thrust of Dr. Lian's remarks, especially the first part uh, of his uh, comments, perhaps a little less in the second. We'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, in particular, uh, I was very struck by his references to the importance of human interaction. Uh, I don't, by this, I don't mean the interactions of Dr. Lien and Hu Jintao, but human interaction uh, among ordinary folk on both sides of the Taiwan Straits uh, in shaping the current situation. Um, and I think to a very large degree that we sometimes forget, without meaning to diminish the, 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 these important signal events and meetings, um, the last 20, 25 years have seen a great deal of um, what we might call people-driven diplomacy. Um, Here's just a, one, of my, one of my favorite slides um, to illustrate this point. It's one of my, it, says, it says you can't go down to the beach. It's forbidden to go down to the beach. Um, it's a picture I took in Jinmen in the early, late, about 2000 or so. Um, I took it just before I went down to the beach. Um, <laughs> and I went down to the beach 
to, to use the, there, there was great irony in this period in Jinmen society, I went down to the beach to engage in the mini three links. Uh, in other words, I went down to the beach to buy products that had been smuggled from the mainland. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of that going on because when I pulled out my camera in 2000, this still caused great trauma uh, for, the, for the participants in the mini three, in the mini three links. Um, the, uh, the other wonderful irony about uh, Jinmen, of course, for those of you, I assume that most of you know J what, what Jinmen is. Jinmen is the small island uh, held by the Republic of China uh, that is only a few uh, uh, hundreds of meters, uh, a, few, a mile or so off the coast of Xiamen. Um, unfortunately, my map doesn't, doesn't work. I made this PowerPoint on the go as I was sort of responding to these remarks or thinking about these remarks. Um, and so in many ways, the three, uh, the three mini links um, when they were officially established in January of 2001 were simply the regularization of activities that had been going on uh, privately for some years before that. Oh, the other, the other wonderful ir ironic uh, phrase besides participating in the mini three small links was uh, piao, to float. Um, the, the, uh, one of the government offices in Jinmen in 2000, um, w they rebuilt the building and there was this beautiful, enormous uh, Lake Tai stone uh, in the courtyard. And so the question arose, well, well how could you get a Tai Hu stone uh, here in Jinmen, given that there's no direct trade links? And the answer was that, oh, it had, it had floated over. Uh, <laughs> this, this three ton or five ton rock. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make, of course, is that, is that um, to a very great degree, the, the early phases of uh, the cross straits accommodation in the 80s and, and even into the 90s and, and more recently was very much driven by civilians. And what, what government officials were really doing was regularizing things that were really going on, um, things that were already going on. Um, to introduce direct cross strait flights, as happened uh, in last year, 2008, um, suggests that maybe that rather smooth phase has reached its limits. Because, of course, you can't have direct cross strait flights because a man who owns a plane in Taipei decides to fly to Beijing. The second point I want to uh, 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 amplify, uh, where I'm very much in agreement with. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Lian, is his point about the extraordinary lives of connections, as I believe the phrase he used, between people on both sides of the straits. I find this now, uh, I find it extraordinary now among students of mine, graduate students of mine, who are participating in cross-strait marriages uh, and sitting in on the same class. Um, one spouse from Taiwan, one spouse from the mainland. Let me just give you uh, another example uh, of, yeah, this is the map that didn't work. Um, I was actually, uh, it's not terribly relevant to this talk, but for moments that you'll see, for reasons that you'll see in a moment, I simply couldn't not show this series of slides. Um, this is the uh, Tsiji Gong uh, outside Xiamen. Um, it, uh, do, do you know where I'm going with this? Not yet. Th th this, I, I, would took this temp I took this picture about a week ago. I took students to see this temple. It's a wonderful temple. Very, very interesting for all kinds of reasons. I'm sure people in this room have been there. Um, one of the things that makes it, in makes it interesting is there's a temple inscription dating from the Kangxi period, uh, mid Kangxi, 1697, um, recording the donations to the temple by the capitans of the Chinese community in Batavia. Uh, so this is a temple that was rebuilt in 1697 by a Chinese living in, in uh, what's now Indonesia. So it's a wonderful story of the, the, the uh, long history of, of uh, the movements of Chinese people around Southeast Asia. Um, it's also, uh, I call it the ancestral temple of Baozhen Dadi. There's actually a big fight over whether it's really the ancestral temple. Um, this is in Zhangzhou. Uh, the people in Quenzhou say they have an ancestral temple of Baozhen Dadi, and there's a big fight over it. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the fight becomes important. This is a picture of, of uh, a, a local plan by the local government basically to um, uh, turn the whole, this, this vast mountain, very, very valuable real estate just outside Xiamen uh, into, a, uh, into a tourist resort. Um, here's the, uh, the, the, the usual picture one takes of the temple trying to get the offerings uh, and the god. And then, oh, look what's that up there. There's the inscription from Lianzhan. 
<laughs> and so when I saw this and I knew I was coming to Berkeley in a couple of days, I really had to, to show it. But it, I think it illustrates a point that I'm trying to make, which is the extraordinary complexity of these connections. Because, well, you probably didn't know it when you, when you uh, uh, wrote the inscription. Uh, you were becoming involved in issues of local planning, uh, debates going on between different regions of Xiamen about uh, who had the, 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 the more uh, realistic claims on certain cultural heritage which could be used to uh, draw in Taiwanese investment. So uh, I very much agree with, with your point about these complex connections. Um, as a cultural and social historian, um, I do want to point out that um, these connections which we generally celebrate uh, are also potentially uh, disruptive and traumatic uh, for the people of, of Taiwan. Um, the, one of the things I hear from my friends on Jinmen, where of course development was suppressed uh, because of geopolitical factors until very recently, um, uh, the, the lie, they, they often say, well, we look, at the, we look at the lights of Xiamen, which you can see from Jinmen. They look at the lights of Xiamen and we look at how prosperous and, and, and fajan it is. Uh, and then we look at us on Jinmen um, and, and, and uh, really wonder um, whether we won or whether we lost or, or what happened. Um, I see it also, this, this, this way in which the connections are traumatic um, among the old soldiers, uh, Dr. Lian mentioned, um, for whom uh, extraordinarily complicated um, uh, family connections have been the, the product uh, or enormously complicated and traumatic family situations. Uh, many of them, of course, were married on the mainland and have remarried on Taiwan. Um, and these new connections are, 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 deeply, are deeply traumatic. Um, these are, in some sense, trivial uh, examples, but uh, there are more profound examples of the destabilizing and traumatic implications of these connections. In particular, of course, I'm talking about the concern about the hollowing out of uh, um, uh, the Taiwanese economy, um, which leads on Jinmen uh, to some rather, some rather desperate solutions uh, being proposed. Uh, these are the central tunnels um, uh, uh, of the Jinmen military base. There's now a big argument going on about Jinmen about uh, perhaps turning them into a casino for uh, shaman uh, gamblers. Um, and it's, it sort of gives a sense of the kind of desperation of uh, um, uh, some people in Taiwan about the current situation. All right, let me, let me move on to the things I don't know anything about. Uh, that's my last slide. You can turn that off. Um, in, I'm going to be, I'm going to be much briefer, by the way. I'll speak for about 10 minutes. Um, the, uh, there was one thing I was struck uh, one absence I was struck by in Dr. Lien's summary of the cross-strait relation, um, very, very, uh, uh, in, uh, 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 feel privileged to, to learn about that process from someone so deeply involved. One thing I thought was missing from that discussion, which was the process of democratization in Taiwan, um, which of course was a hugely complicating factor in the cross-straits relation. Um, I was sorry that it wasn't mentioned. I think it's a, it's a, um, uh, uh, it's a, it's really a great triumph of the people of Taiwan, of which they should be, um, and many of our, uh, and uh, should be and are um, extremely proud. Um, and uh, but I want to talk a little bit now about the consequences of that. Um, first, let me say one one. I'm going to speculate. And I think you'll have a chance to respond and tell me I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> One reason why I think that, that the, the democratization process and the celebration of the democratization process in Taiwan is heard less these days um, is that um, the validity and the legitimacy of that process is denied in the PRC. Um, the democracy of Taiwan is, um, uh, in, in the words of some voices in the PRC, uh, a sham. Um, it's not real democracy. Um, and I think this is. Uh, um, it's not real democracy in the sense that real democracy uh, is a political system in which the interests, the material interests of the people uh, are the first priority of the government. Um, and I just want to say something about how I think this is really a, a, a remarkable 
um, uh, a remarkable global fact over the last 30 years. Um, we've heard in the United States for quite some time that um, engagement, well, engagement of the PRC is no longer really in question, but certainly in, this, in the 70s and 80s, we heard that engagement with the PRC was a good thing because that engagement would lead to the PRC's acceptance of international norms. And what I want to suggest is that, in fact, in some ways, in some areas, that has happened. It's true. But in other areas, um, it's actually led to the reverse. Uh, it's led to the world accepting PRC norms. And I think that it's very important that, the PR, that, that, that Taiwan uh, uh, continue to hold its democracy and its democratization process as a triumph, as a true democracy, um, uh, and stand up to arguments about what a true democracy is and isn't. Let me turn now to um, the connection to, I think, a problem that I think it's possible, that, 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 that concerns me in the process that, that Dr. Lian has outlined, um, which is the fundamental, um, both, both, both the PRC and the ROC on Taiwan claim to be democracies. Um, there's a fundamental difference between those democracies. Um, well, cynically, well, yes. L let's accept those claims at face value uh, and, and say, well, what are the differences between those democracies? Um, one difference is that in the multi-party uh, democracy uh, on Taiwan, the main function of political parties is to contest elections. That's what political parties do in uh, a multi-party democracy like Taiwan. Um, in the PRC, of course, one particular political party plays a rather larger role. Um, And so we've got a, a sort of fundamental disparity between the roles of political parties in the two political systems that have, have emerged. Um, Dr. Lien has been an active participant, a leading participant, in carving out a new role for uh, the KMT, which is, of course, to shape cross-straits relations and cross-straits negotiations. Um, President Ma, in May of 2008, um, affirmed the position that the KMT's role was purely advisory. That as president, he made the decisions about cross-straits negotiations. But I think one of, the, one of the concerns I have from today's presentation is that there are clearly um, some ambiguities on that, on that issue. Uh, as Dr. Leanne said, uh, the, the, the system that uh, you established with your 2005 visit was a system for cross-strait coordination. I should wrap up shortly. I want to suggest a couple of implications of this. Professor Walkman this morning talked about the need to prepare the populaces in the two countries for a political accommodation in which people have to compromise, which, in which there has to be compromise. There cannot be a political accommodation without compromises, which means people have to give something up. Um, and he suggested that uh, the PRC was not engaged, or the leadership of the PRC was not engaged in that process of preparation. Um, I would also suggest that from my limited uh, uh, observation of this issue in the PRC. I've never researched it, but I spend a lot of time in the PRC, and since I write about Jim and I end up talking about cross-straits relations a lot, um, that the subtleties of the differences between the two political parties uh, and the role that the political parties play in their respective political systems is not something that the populace of the PRC uh, has been particularly well prepared for. Uh, when triumphs of negotiation are celebrated uh, in the PRC media, uh, there is rarely the proviso that all that's happened is a body that advises the president uh, has come to certain conclusions. Um, and so I think this is potentially a, a potentially dangerous situation uh, in, in the future. We know that the PRC leadership is constrained to some extent by public, public opinion. That's the $100,000 question is to what extent? Um, I worry a little bit that the subtleties of the current situation are not fully understood in the PRC. 
The other and the final point um, that I think follows from this difference between the role of political parties in the two systems um, is that the PRC leadership recognizes that in a multi-party democracy like Taiwan, political parties lose elections. That it may one day face a green government, despite the current disarray of the DPP. And therefore, that any future cross straits accord must be acceptable to all the people of Taiwan, not simply uh, supporters of the Kuomintang and that therefore it must be cautious. We heard this morning, I think from Professor Rigger, that um, public opinion in Taiwan constrains the behavior both of the DPP, both of the green and of the blue. What I want to suggest, if you, follow, if you agree with my argument, that public opinion in Taiwan also constrains the freedom of action of the CCP. Um, Looked at that in a negative way, one could argue that the, um, there are obstacles to a political entente, the political entente that, that in some sense we all desire, there are obstacles to that political entente that are structurally embedded in the process that Dr. Lien has initiated and been so involved in, and that dealing with those structural obstacles is going to be a real problem. Um, the... Um, the other, the other uh, really um, remarkable um, uh, point, I think, that, that comes from this is um, that I've somehow talked myself into an argument which has the CCP um, responsive to public opinion in Taiwan in a way that it's never been responsive to public opinion in, in the mainland, but that's another, another story. Um, let me wrap up. The theme of... Um, Dr. Lien's speech is, of course, the, has been the, the, the rapidity of change from confrontation to conciliation. And I agree that it's, it's absolutely remarkable. Um, in my remarks so far, I've tried to suggest two of the um, most, uh, uh, one of the most surprising um, dimensions of that change, namely the sophisticated understanding of multi-party democracy that is currently um, uh, prevails in Zhongnanhai. Uh, which I think none of us would have predicted uh, a decade ago, even. Um, I am less confident, to be honest, about the smoothness of the process going forward, although I will certainly, just to repeat, recognize the extraordinary changes. Um, just to, to, to tell one other little anecdote from Jinmen, um, uh, on this same trip, Dr. Dr. Lian mentioned um, military issues, which have traditionally been a stumbling block. Um, after going to the Baoshan Dadi Temple in, in Tiananmen, I took the boat to, uh, to Jinmen. So I took the boat from the mainland to, to ROC territory. Very easy. Bought a ticket for 100 kwai. Um, and I met there with the commanding general of the Jinmen garrison, who was very, very concerned because there are plans afoot to build a bridge from the mainland to Jinmen. Uh, and so he was being called upon to prepare a new military plan to defend Jinmen if there was a four-lane highway uh, from Xiamen to Jinmen. I mean, I really I felt terribly sorry for the man because um, he because he he had just grown up in such a different world, um, and here he was being called upon to face these extraordinary changes. It's extraordinary, an extraordinary world. Bob Scalapino this morning referred to it as a revolutionary era uh, that we are in now. Um, it has been a privilege uh, to hear from a man with an extraordinary role in shaping that extraordinary world. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sony. I'd like to uh, just briefly uh, respond to uh, your comment. Uh, I agree with uh, all your observations, and uh, uh, but the <clears throat> uh, the important point that you made is about uh, uh, the uh,
what is what is the uh, the degree of consensus <laughs> that existing today? I think uh, it certainly would be uh, premature for me to say that uh, there is a consensus uh, among all political groups in Taiwan uh, in its relationship vis-a-vis -vis the mainland today. There is no such uh, consensus uh, as we know it exists existing. Actually, uh, main, the Taiwan's uh, mainland policy has been uh, highly divided along partisan lines. So you want to have anything in the future that will come to a truce or a peace agreement. This, of course, is a very thorny, very difficult issue. I take that for granted because it is true. Partisan politics in Taiwan is so divided, particularly in our relations with vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mainland. But on the other hand, it's quite interesting because it seems to me out of the increasingly more and more accumulated literatures on cross-strait relationship, there is certain degree, if I don't use the word high degree, but certain degree of convergence among all these political writings dealing with peace agreement. I don't know why. So this is uh, the talking about discussion on the peace agreement is not a monopoly for KMT only. It was joined by hundreds now. There is accumulated literature. It's so voluminous that I was scared myself when I, before I come here, I want to check how many, uh, how many articles, how many uh, 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 books written on this, increasingly more and more. Now, out of this literature, and I find, I said, convergence. For example, both the DPP party and the Taiwan Solidarity Union agreed and emphasized the policy to conclude a peace agreement with mainland but only when they were in power. Once they left, they lost the power, there was a changing attitude. But when they are in power, you can go back and see all the materials. They're all for the signing of a peace agreement with mainland China. This includes Mr. Li, this includes Mr. Chen, and include many of the leadership. But their political personalities. There are also some scholars, independent scholars. We call it the greenish scholars. Uh, we say DPP orientation. I don't have to name their names. But they came out with articles uh, and uh, even booklets uh, supporting the signing of the peace agreement with uh, men and China. One professor concretely and literally suggested that we should conclude a peace agreement with mainland for an interim period of 50 years. That can be considered either too long or too short. But he was con very concrete in this. Uh, another 
All of those you call it greenish scholars. I don't blame them because this is all very useful. Yeah. And suggested that why don't we use uh, the idea of so-called common country. Uh, what is common country? He said this can be used as a replacement to solve the problem, the argument, the debate over the principle of one China. Why don't we use a common country? And he elaborated in great detail about the virtues of common country. And he is a DPP uh, supporter. There are also social groups, quite a few social groups. Uh, for example, a, a, a handicapped lady, uh, Liu Xia, proposed the Taiwan, uh, the so-called Liang An, uh, uh, peace declaration. He, I, she itemized so many, many uh, conditions. Most of them are for a signing of a peace agreement. There's another one, General, I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Chen, a labor union leader, also provided, submitted, and proposed the so-called cross-strait uh, uh, peace guidelines. Also, he well, he proposed some very concrete uh, uh, articles. I mentioned this to 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 express the view that there are some supports coming from the. Uh, other political parties and part other political groups in supporting of this uh, eventual peace conclusion of a peace agreement. It's not all so-called blue, blue scholars or blue personalities. This is uh, uh, my point of view. Because uh, it's uh, premature to say that uh, there is a consensus among all political groups in this particular issue. It's not true. But there is a great, to a greater ex a degree, a convergence where people are interested in advancing their particular uh, proposals leading to the conclusion of an eventual peace agreement. This is what's happening uh, today uh, in Taiwan. Now, It is true that uh, Mr. Ma uh, expressed uh, different views on the political issues across the street. I mentioned uh, his uh, uh, lecture in London School of Economics, where he said the peace agreement will serve as the basis of a framework for peace in the future decade. And when during the uh, election campaign, he pointed out that uh, it is so important that he promised that if, get, if, got, if he is elected, he will conclude a peace agreement with uh, men in China during his term of service. This is all on the record. But uh, on the other hand, the, in, in recent months particularly, the official uh, Taiwan response to the call of signing a political agreement uh, become less forceful. The government pointed out that uh, it is Im to, it's, easy, it's important to handle the economic issues first, and then we will take up the political ones. It is uh, logical for Taiwan to handle 
the easier issues first, and then coming to a more difficult ones. Now this is the, uh, the, the, the recent response. Less force waste. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Ma also pointed out that uh, uh, recently that uh, he will not touch, he will not touch political issues during his first term of service. Although he did not rule out doing so in his second term, uh, if she, I mean, if he is, he got re-elected, so it become a little ambiguous, ambiguous. But out of this very ambiguous picture, what I want to point out is there is a, such a convergence of ideas, yeah. Uh, among different groups. Although there's no consensus, but there's a high degree of convergence. And out of this high degree of convergence, some broad strokes about the future political picture becomes discernible. It seems to me, become discernible. Yeah. Not everybody saying the same thing at the same time, but there are issues mentioned emphasized by all groups. And out of this literature, this writing, this uh, expressions, uh, public expressions, I draw some lessons. I, I draw some common points. And that is first, I, I, I just mentioned the first, based on 92 consensus. Uh, 92 consensus and one China principle, which is provided in Taiwan's constitution for the signing of an interim uh, peace agreement for the maintenance of the status quo. Yeah. This is uh, becoming a common ground for, uh, of course, there are, there are different ideas about this too. Yeah. And uh, then you have the, what do you do with the, uh, military uh, security. I mentioned this. What do you do with the foreign uh, diplomatic relations? I mentioned. And also, what do you do with the economics uh, policies, which is the easier, easiest part uh, of all? Well, this is my brief, re, uh, not response, but uh, a, 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 something to add to your point. Thank you very much. Thank you for your further comments. Um, I would like to uh, tell you now that we have some time for uh, questions. But unfortunately, I've been uh, forcefully uh, informed <laughs> that we are on a very tight schedule. So after thanking all the participants in today's conference, I will uh, declare the conference uh, adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.